the cloud today When it's cold outside I've got the monkey man Everybody say It is December the 9th, 2022, a Friday, the end of the week, and uh, for a week in tech. Fortunately, we're not going to be talking about Twitter or Musk too much today, which has become very boring and stale. There's only one word or two letters that summarize this week, AI. Keith, is this the week that AI became real? Well, it's definitely the week that everyone's talking about it, isn't it? Um, it, It's almost like Web3 doesn't exist anymore. Everyone's talking about AI, mainly because of chat, GPT. And um, the talk is all over the map. Um, uh, I I coined the title of my newsletter this week, Can Bad AI Be Good?, which is really a reflection of the underlying conversation where many, many people are saying it's bad and many, many other people are saying it's good. And they've all got examples, and they're all right. Meaning that it actually works, right? Let's be clear, because there are two debates on AI. One is, it does it actually work? And secondly, if it does work, is that good or bad? So, right. So this is pertaining to does it work, rather than is it ethical? So let's let's just remind ourselves what exactly is Chat GPT. So it's basically an application sitting on top of OpenAI's model, which is what's called a a large language model. So it's very, very enormous in terms of the data that it has sitting underneath it. And uh, they wanted to give an easy way for people to engage with it. So they built um, what is effectively a chatbot interface where you can type questions or suggestions, all kinds of stuff, Uh, and it will do its best to do what you ask for. Uh, And so everyone's experimenting with it because it's super easy. And um, it it turns out that um, it's really good at some things. It's not so good at some other things. Uh, But but compared to getting answers to queries, which you would have had to do on Google for the most part, it's a completely new paradigm of how to ask and get answers so just to remind ourselves chat gpt is a project of open ai right correct sam altman is the founder and ceo there and then where does it get its intelligence is it's not just from language i mean where does it i like everybody else i played around with it so i made some entries um sometimes it, it it's not willing to make any value judgments which probably makes it stronger, but it knows a lot. Where, where's its knowledge from? Where's it getting its well, facts? There, there's really, um, to simplify it, there's three layers. The, the base layer is just information, uh, raw information, uh, text. Uh, uh, yeah, but where? Is it, is it like Google in the, the entire, internet? The internet. It essentially just download the internet? It downloads the internet and then some. They're, they're probably fed it with things beyond the internet. Um, so it's it's as much of the totality of human knowledge as it can get. Um, and can they do that? Because I remember when uh, Google downloaded the internet in the early days in 97, 98, they essentially had to appropriate all the computers at Stanford. And this was when the internet was, God knows what, a hundredth, a thousandth, a millionth of the size it is now. Where do they get their, their, their computer power to do this, OpenAI? Well, the computer power comes from the cloud. They use, they're using uh, Azure, actually, Microsoft's platform as their primary platform. Um, uh, this week, Sam Altman thanked Microsoft and said it wouldn't have been possible to build GPT without uh, a cloud infrastructure like that that can scale. Uh, even then, they're challenged. They've had to throttle new signups uh, due to overwhelming demand uh, uh, while they increase the use of Microsoft. So there's a big cost at the the back end. Um, And then they access any public knowledge they can, anything public, and they can probably also buy access to private knowledge if people want to sell it to them. 
But the goal is to have as much of human knowledge as possible available to at the bottom layer. Then there's two other layers. The, the, the next layer above is um, what you could think of as uh, where they train GPT on specific data sets. Uh, and, and that will be uh, what's called models. And these models, they're, they're, there are many, many, many of them. There probably ultimately are millions of them, uh, uh, are all good at different things. So they probably train a model on the Python programming language. They train another one on English literature. Uh, uh, they train another one on biology and so on and so forth. So there'll be there are lots and lots of training models. And within uh, machine learning, there are well-known uh, model types that, that their PhDs will be leveraging to train models. And different types of training are, are relevant to different types of data. So it's a very complex middle layer. And then the top layer is what you and I use, which is where we form, uh, we form a, an input that it tries to understand. And that creates a kind of a natural language layer where they take what we say and tr turn it into something that GPT can understand and then know which models are appropriate for answering. And it does it very fast. Within a second, you start to get an answer. Well, sometimes it takes more than a second, maybe two or three seconds. Yeah, yeah. But those are the layers. And I think at all three layers, they've got the biggest, so far, the biggest um, contribution to the to the to the area of, of, of anyone, um, you know they so 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 that's why it, it they could make a public. So interest. why is it this week we've we've known about AI for a while? What are the, what what happened this week to make GPT so such a big story? They externalized the top layer to everyone. So now we can all use it. Yeah. So it's like Google was building its search engine in a garage, and eventually it had a website, and now you could go and use it. Is this a threat or a compliment to Google? Is it an either or, or is Google dependent in, uh, sorry, is, a, uh, is GPT essentially dependent on the Google search engine for this knowledge? No, it doesn't use the Google search engine at all. So, so I, I, I would say that uh, it is not a current threat to Google because Google, Google is more accurate and can do more things. Uh, from a paradigm point of view, it's a significant threat to Google because you're, you're moving from a typed in keyword based search engine to what is essentially a human like interaction with knowledge. But why couldn't Google combine the idea of search with this interface so that when you entered something in Google, it would spit out your answers with links? Uh, it could. Google, uh, oh, they have an API and Google could certainly send search queries to that API. Um, it just wouldn't be, you know, it, it, th that's a little bit like, you know, a hybrid between the present and the past. And I don't think hybrids usually survive the test of time. So, so I, but in an odd way, thinking about it, I've used it. Um, it doesn't come with links. So in an odd way, it's almost an anachronism. It's, it's a return to traditional text. It's a return to traditional text. Uh, I'd be pretty surprised if it, if, if it doesn't evolve to be able to give you suggested links for, for things, but uh, maybe it right. won't. It's kind of like anti-internet. I mean, the whole point of the internet is links. So if you just go to GP, chat at GPT to get all your answers, you're not really using the internet. This could be just a, a walled garden on an app. Yeah, I think that's that's accurate. It it is a walled garden. It's a, it's a big walled garden, but it's a walled garden, and in that sense, it's just an application with multiple layers, uh, not that different to say Amazon it, it, uh, or or Google for that matter. Google isn't the internet. Google's one. Yeah, but Google. But the the, the beauty of Google. Some people might say it's not particularly beautiful. Is it? Is it's a link based search? Google doesn't pretend it knows anything or all it does is it give you links. Well, uh, uh, that used to be true in the pure Google. Nowadays, the top third of the page is curated by them. Well, they have a business model, which we, we don't know what a open AI's business model is going to be. Presumably, you're either going to have to pay for it or come with advertising in some way. Yeah. 
Well, you can already see, like, um, just to give some context here, uh, developers have been using uh, GitHub Pilot for some time now, and GitHub Pilot writes code. Uh, it, you basically get it to produce code, and then you can edit it. Um, uh, uh, GPT is already good at code, um, at least not 100% good, but it's pretty decent um, at code in a bunch of different programming languages. I got it to write a Swift computer code this week, which is what you use to build apps for the iPhone. And um, it, it didn't quite work, but it was about 90% of the effort in a second. Um, and, and, you know, so I think there's certain tasks that it is going to save human time on, a lot of human time. Uh, we, I got it to answer some questions. I got it yesterday. I put it in my editorial to write me a song in the style of Eleanor Rigby, uh, 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 as in it was about a person, a mother in this case, uh, uh, using the singing style of Bruce Springsteen. And it wrote me a whole song uh, taking my input as the per, what the song was about. So you can see that, that there's many, many people who do stuff that are going to be able to use it to do some of the work. Yeah. So the really interesting thing is that this marks a beginning. I mean, it clearly is not perfect. Lots of articles you cite about how it gets stuff wrong. But it is a coherent product which appears sometimes to be credible. So is this the beginning of our AI age? It's obviously going to get significantly better. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got to imagine that there are, that Google's working on something, that um, other companies are going to be working on stuff. Yeah, I, th I think it's the beginning of the, um, the engagement of the whole human race with AI. Obviously, there's a whole history of AI leading up to this moment. But I think it's the it's the point at which all of us are going to be able to use it for some good purpose that we'll be pleased about. And 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 then we'll be disappointed a lot. Like I, I make the point that Alta Vista was often disappointing. Uh, and uh, Google is often disappointing, actually. Um, it, there's so much spam in it these days. But um, yeah, but we've uh, all learned to navigate that spam or most of us have we know when we enter something in google we know what to avoid we we can see the ads and we know what we're looking for I and mean, it's like yeah. any kind of search on or offline yeah. It, yeah it requires some sort of human curation yeah so um how, how big a deal is this do you think for open ai i mean musk's involved uh, some of the smartest people in silicon valley some of the most controversial too well so, that of course Musk became a bit of an enemy of it this week, even though he was an original. He's an enemy of everything. Is this is this the beginning of the Sam Altman age? He seems to have been quiet recently. I know you're a big admirer of his vision and his intelligence. Um, yeah, I think, look, M Musk makes the point that OpenAI was meant to be a not-for-profit, and it's now a for-profit. Surprise, um, surprise, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, that's fair enough, really. That's true. And it, Altman probably has to explain why he thinks that's the right thing to do. Uh, I think it's pretty obvious, right? It's got huge costs. So somebody has to pay for that. Um, uh, and it isn't going to be like Wikipedia or donation based because it's bigger than that. So, so Wikipedia was a contribution earlier in the same you know, if right. you need to write the history. The closest thing to me is Wikipedia, where uh, I've all, you know, historically I was a critic of Wikipedia. Now, actually, I'm an admirer. I think it's it's very good generally. Um, couldn't Wikipedia? Couldn't you just build this intelligence from Wikipedia? Some of it, um, and, and I'm sure they do. By the way, I'm sure part of what mm. she knows about comes from Wikipedia, and that's been a, a, a theme of a bunch of search products over the years. Have used Wikipedia as a base. Um, so I'm sure there is some overlap there, but um, I, I, I think that we, we're getting to the point where um, it, 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 it's kind of dangerous in some areas. So let's talk about what's bad about it. If, if people rely on it, especially uh, the focus this week has been on kids in school using it to write essays, which they can. Yeah. 
uh, it will be wrong a lot because it doesn't yet understand the corpus of knowledge in a specific enough way. So uh, um, Ben Thompson gives an example of asking whether Hobbes and Locke agreed on. Yeah, I saw that. And you, I think you cite that. And of course, right. many people think Hobbes and Locke are in agreement, but they're very different. But they're very different. And, and so why does it think that? Because it's read a lot of sentences pertaining to democracy, the early days of democracy, that, in, that where Hobbes and Locke are being contrasted and it doesn't understand they're being contrasted. It, it thinks they're... Although, to be fair to Hobbes and Locke, um, it's still debatable. I mean, Hobbes and Locke share a lot and they disagree on stuff. I mean, there's no complete ultimate answer. There's no scientific answer to how Hobbes and Locke differ. Well, it's a matter of interpretation and they're writing at different times in some ways about different subjects. So, Yeah, but nobody thinks of Locke as the father of democracy. You mean Hobbes? Uh, uh, Hobbes, sorry, as the father of democracy. Yes, they do. I mean, some people would see, some people would, or many people have argued that you can't get to Locke without Hobbes. Well, I think that's In the also... same way as you can't get to Marx without Hegel, even if Hegel wasn't a revolutionary communist. I mean, it's all part of a, a narrative. But, but on the specifics, uh, Ho and this is Thompson I'm quoting here, but Ho Hobbes was a proponent of absolutism, the belief that an absolute monarchy was the absolute best form of rule. No, he wasn't. I mean, this guy, what is he, some computer person? What does he know? Well, he, that's nonsense. That's just not true. He doesn't know. <coughs> that's, it's way more complicated than that. Well, he's not writing an essay. It's just... Yeah, but I mean, that, but that's exactly why these judgments are wrong, because that's as wrong as uh, as, as his critique of open AI on, on, on its interpretation of Hobbes. Hobbes and, had a much more nuanced, complicated, complex view on power and the state and monarchy. I mean, it's oversimplified. But he didn't believe in what Locke called the separation of powers, you know, that were equally weighty in society. Well, Locke was not a theorist. Anyway, I mean, that's not the issue. But, but the, uh, the, anyway, the point the, is, is that these things are open to interpretation. And Yeah, you and know, GP, I mean, GPT-3 doesn't really interpret them. They, it, it all Right, it's hard. I mean, just as Marx wasn't a Marxist, Locke probably wasn't Lockean or Hobbes wasn't Hobbesian. I mean, these things yeah. are really complicated. But it is a beginning, Keith, right? And as you say, I've always thought Web 3 was just the wishful thinking of Web 2.0 people who think, well, let's get another chance and get it right. But this is completely different. It's this completely does represent a new, a, a new way of thinking about everything, new, new, major new business opportunities. Yeah. Exactly, and there's been a few of those. It's a, let's let uh, uh, I in my editorial I quote this Alan Kay from the 70s at Xerox Park talking about a Kuhnian paradigm shift, and and I think Kuhn, for those who don't know, was was uh, basically in the history of knowledge talks about paradigm shifts, and um, a paradigm shift is when the canvas changes completely. Yeah. And the whole human experience is either degraded or upgraded based on a, on a complete shift on the canvas. And this promises to be that. And, 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 uh, and Although, I mean, talking about Google, I mean, Google was always an AI company. It was always built on some sort of artificial intelligence. And all these companies, all the big companies from Amazon to Google to Microsoft, they're all... Uh, AI companies or wannabe AI companies. So this isn't, this well, just represents the first time that it actually works. It, or, or at least gets or close seems, to work. Yeah, gets close at least. Yeah. Doesn't seem to be just garbled nonsense and a waste of time. I mean, we're not a specialist show, but it is worth saying that there is a massive difference between statistical, um, statistical uh, methods being used on data which is really what Google was. The, they were counting links and things yeah. and, then, and then ranking, which is kind of a bit like what I do at Signal Rank, where I, I wouldn't really call Signal Rank AI. Uh, that said, other people do because the popular understanding doesn't distinguish between statistical models and AI. Right. I think G, chat GPT really also isn't really AI. It, it's more like 
um, statistical models apply to huge data sets. Um, and, and so that, we that, that's where you get, I mean, AI can, it has to learn something. It can't just be smart. I mean, where, it's got to get its data from somewhere. That's what it learns to be smart, doesn't it? Yeah, it has to get data from somewhere. It can't, um, just, it can't just be smart without downloading ridiculous amounts of data. On you know, it can't just know about Hobbes and Locke. It has to learn it from somewhere. Yeah, well, it it, it goes beyond keyword matching against the data. Right. Google basically is link counting and keyword matching at its core. There's lots of other things as well. So what's the consensus? I saw that Gary Marcus, who was on my Keenon show, one of um, one of the most respected AI people said, well, people saying that it's the end of Google, but actually it depends on Google. You say it doesn't depend on Google. What's the consensus if there is one on AI experts on, on, on this GPT thing? Yeah. Well, G G Google, just to contextualize it, Google in this context might be best thought of as radio. Radio hasn't gone away. Uh, search won't go away. Yeah. Um, but, this is a whole new set of human interactions that may end up being bigger than search. Uh, and, and so that's probably the right way to think about it. So Google, Google's revenue comes from the number of times people do searches. Actually, chat GPT is better for a whole bunch of those searches than searches. Uh, and, and, so, and, and it gives more and it saves more human time. So you you know you can't. It's also a kind of search. You enter it into a box. You say, you know, how is Hobbes different from Locke? And it comes up with an answer in the same way as you might put into Google Hobbes and Locke compare and contrast. Yeah, but 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 the, you must admit the outputs are totally different. Yeah, the outputs are different, but it, it's it's not. I mean, you talk about the paradigm shift. It's not that is well, not a paradigm shift. We go on. The internet. Either we put it into the Google box or we put it into the GPT box. Well, that me mechanically you're right. So let's just agree that we're on the same ground there. Mechanically, there's a box you write something into and something comes back. But what comes back on Google is way less usable than what comes back on Chat GPT for any purpose you might have. Like Google won't write code for you. Chat GPT will. Google won't write an essay. Yeah, I don't understand. So, so I, I, I'm not a coder like you. What does this mean in terms of writing code? So you mean you could put something into this, 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 um, this engine? How does it enable you to write code? I don't understand. So let let let's do a live example. Write a short program in. Python to create random numbers. And the, here is a short program in Python to create random numbers. And so it's you, sort of like software, basically. Well, it's like a programmer. It's, it's going away. It's another way of doing... Uh, and and explain how how does that help you as a programmer? What, what would a programmer normally have to do? I can copy and paste that now into my own program. But what, if before this, what, what would you have to do? Before this, I might do a Google search for somebody that's done this. But how would you do it in the first place? How would you get it? Get it when you say get it. What do you mean? Well, you say you would do a search to take it from someone else, but what happens if you wanted to start from scratch? If I wanted to start from scratch, I'd, I'd, I'd um, make sure my computer could run the Python programming language, and I'd write this in a, in a notebook and then uh, run it in my Python compiler stroke interpreter. So is this, for you, is this piece of it in some ways more... More, more, more radical, more, bigger change, a bigger deal than the tech stuff on Hobbs and Locke? Oh, much bigger, yeah. Like, yeah much bigger. So you know, we're all getting that we're, we're being misled. We're, we're seeing our Hobbs and Locke, but we're actually, the real thing we should be looking at is Python. So uh, if I do this, uh, between 
write the 1,000 word essay on the difference between Hobbes and Locke. Yeah. It, it's going to do it for me. And I can copy and paste it and send it to my teacher. Yeah, but you just, but that's not really very, it might be valuable to a kid at school, but it's not very valuable for human knowledge and for the creation of stuff. It's just creating a sort of a, yeah, that's what well, that's generic very... product. But this other this this software piece sounds to me maybe because I don't really understand software to be more radical, more significant. Yeah, well, I I, I think um, when I talked about the limits, I said it it really isn't AI. Um, what it is is natural language processing on top of a massive set of knowledge. Um, and it doesn't really have the ability to know right and wrong within that, but it's pretty decent. Yeah, but no and, one's ever, but, but no one ever presents AI as something that's going to be able to distinguish between right and wrong. Let's, uh, Keith, you've got lots of links in your newsletter this week. What, what is the, the most compelling argument in favor of why this is good and versus why it isn't working or it's worrying? Which one, which articles do you think are the best? Um, Probably Ben Thompson's article that focuses in on its weaknesses is the one that also best expresses why why it's good. Um, it's the um, it's uh, stratechery or strategic. Yeah, you like this guy. He, he's thoughtful and he writes at length, and he, he he's you know he can't he kind of uh, goes both ways. But as you can see, this is called AI homework. Okay, um, and then the the one that the one that you so is he saying it's good or bad? He's the one who's criticizing it. And then there's a there's there's a report which I think is really worth reading about the state of AI in general. Yeah, uh, which is a more broad sweep that puts uh, chat AI in context and Dali and and things like that. Yeah, I mean Dali we haven't even mentioned. Dali is another piece in the. Uh, in the open AI art, artillery, is this connected or is it an entirely separate product? It's an entirely separate product focused on, on image generation. So Dali has to be worth hundreds of billions. I mean, what is what do you think uh, um, Altman wants to do with, the, with uh, open AI now? Hard to tell. I think, you know, we, we, he's been interviewed at length a couple of times recently where he combines um, a zeal for um, supplementing humans with, with artificial intelligence from a task-based point of view. Like, if you have to write an essay, if you have to write some code, um, he's not really trying to create general artificial intelligence he doesn't believe we're even close to that being right possible. but it's open ai do you see it as a i mean the, well maybe we're limited with language because it's different but is it a platform it's a platform but it's a post-platform platform it's not a platform like google or facebook well well open it's ai like a, a new no open AI. AI. it's combining the old sort of microsoft and the new Google, isn't it? Yeah, o OpenAI basically is 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 a think tank. Um, it's a commercial think tank that builds first of all capabilities and then products. So D Dali and ChatGPT are products, but behind that, there's basically a laboratory stroke think tank with lots of PhDs building capabilities using methods but are these open you know we always, uh, people always talk about these open platforms open standards is the software that uh, open ai is using is it open to other developers or do they own it i mean google never gave away the secret source to its search engine so no one could ever no one can replicate the google search engine can, uh, no. uh, if, if someone said, oh, this is amazing, I want to build my own G chat GPT, is the knowledge out there or is it now being turned into a walled garden by OpenAI? There are people building uh, parallel software that 
that has similar capabilities with larger data sets than OpenAI. Uh, so so I, I'd say the answer is yes, other people can, because when I talked about the methods underneath the products, those are in, in scientific papers that are publicly available for everyone. So any, anyone that's capable of understanding this field can go and take those scientific papers, can implement uh, the methods and can, if they can access data, build similar functionalities. So could DeepMind just replicate this and turn it into a Google product, given that DeepMind is owned by Google? Well, DeepMind is a very different technology. It's called reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is, is good at playing games, for example. Mm. Um, it, it, it just came out yesterday that DeepMind's... Um, uh, attempt to recreate human proteins is flawed in some ways. Um, so it's not so good once it goes outside of learning repetitive tasks through reinforcement learning. So that's a good insight because at lower down in the layers, DeepMind uses totally different scientific methods than, than GPT-3 uses. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I get the sense, Keith, you're dancing around these questions, partly probably because you don't know the answer. Maybe no one knows the answer. I, I'm still not clear. No, because... because is OpenAI, is it a proprietary... Are they using proprietary technology that means that they already have a lead in this, that no one can catch up in the way that Google got that no, lead when they downloaded no. the internet back in 97, 98? No, they're not. They're, they're, they, are, they probably have proprietary data, and they definitely do have proprietary uh, data science algorithms uh, uh, the, and, and models, but other people can produce equally powerful proprietary versions as well. And at the end of the day, what gets used is going to be what is best. So I don't so think... It's the old I mean, Alta Vista versus... So this could be good news for the... The situation we find ourselves or we found ourselves with Web 2.0, the walled garden situation, this could actually represent the beginning of the real potential, the openness of the Internet in theory, although you never know in practice, of course. Yeah. Well, one thing we know for sure is these are private companies. Uh, governments can't really compete in this world. And so the, the, the short term end game is going to result in people like Sam Altman having super powerful software that lots and lots of human beings use. Yeah. And we're going to end up with the question, is it okay for this to be owned by private corporations or, or should it be a, a utility for the human race? Right, that's, um, that's a web to, you know, we've already had that question. And I, I'm guessing that Chinese companies are working on something similar, perhaps even backed by the Chinese government. Yeah, well, all, of course, all these things are backed by governments because governments give grants and stuff. But um, mm. I don't think that's uh, the scary version of being backed by governments, even in China. I think governments obviously have a self-interest, like the French government is super focused on trying to create a European search engine or a European mm. fill-in-the-blank. Yeah, they're all, only 20 all governments years do out that, but... Like the French, generally, they're only 20 years out of date. Anything else going on this week? Because this is certainly not the last time we talk about AI. Any other non-interesting AI stories this week, Keith? Uh, no, I think we should. We're, we're well over 30 minutes, so we should probably move on. Uh, the startup of the week is worth mentioning. Startup of the week is... Uh, a little company that I invested in many moons ago whilst at ADV called, what's called Chargeify, now called Cadence. This is a, a story of a British uh, entrepreneur who moved to Sunnyvale, uh, left his team in Ireland and, and London and came here to pioneer. And um, uh, COVID destroyed his entire business model. And he pivoted and he's now raised $10 million for uh, the next iteration of what uh, his vision is. And it's a massive success story set against huge challenges. So I thought it deserves startup. Of the and week. finally, Tweet of the Week. It's an AI tweet. Tweet of the Week comes from Aaron Levy, who, if you don't know, is the CEO of Box.net. The power of chat GPT is instant, on-demand, ubiquitous knowledge on any subject because it 
lowers the barrier to exploring curiosity on anything, it ultimately is most likely to dramatically increase the demand for expertise. So he's predicting more jobs for experts to, to, to correct G, chat GPT's errors. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Well, certainly something we come back to, Keith. We will talk again. We've gone over our time, but this is an AI show. More AI to come. And we will talk again next week. We will. Thanks, everyone. On a cloudy day When it's cold outside